Guys, I'm going to go old school today. I'm going to go to uh, some mon uh, some fundamental sales skills training for you guys today. I'm going to just chip away and teach you guys some uh, some uh, fundamentals and things like that. So I'm going to just start off and go through some techniques and some dialogues and some patterns and things like that just to get you guys up to speed from, from the sales side of things and the sales skills side of things. So Starting off with, there are a couple of techniques or a number of techniques that we use to get clients and customers and people to trust us, to like us, to feel more comfortable with us, connect with us. And I'm going to go through those first. So technique number one, which I'm sure most people are aware of and most people are are, are adhered to in that. And one of the most effective ways of getting people to like me and trust me and to do business with me is using the acronym and the technique called Ford. Uh, so you're asking people about their family, you're asking people about their occupation, you're asking people about what they do for fun and hobbies and things like that. And then you're asking people what they do if they had all the time and money in the world uh, and things on their bucket list and letting people speak and letting people tell their story and who doesn't want to talk about themselves, who doesn't want to tell their story. And this makes them feel like you're somebody they can talk to, somebody that cares for them, feel like somebody they like and trust in that in a simple, powerful way using that Ford technique. Okay. Everybody comfortable with it. Everybody knows how to use it. Everybody is aware of it. No questions asked. We're good. Yep. Yep. Okay. Next one, a safe island technique. So, this is when I meet people for the first time and I'm sitting down doing a one-on-one -on -one or I'm doing a sales meeting with them or an advisement session with them or something like that. And so this a safe island technique is what you tell people what is going to happen, what is going to be talked about, what is going to be discussed and what's going to go on before it actually happens, before it actually gets talked about and before it gets discussed. So all of us don't like surprises. All of us are already nervous and uncertain and we've never met each other and it's uncomfortable as it is. But if you tell people and, and, and share with them what you're going to talk about, what we're going to go through and what's going to happen and what you're going to experience, the safe island makes them feel calmer, more uh, comfortable and more relaxed. And it kind of takes the elephant out of the room and the unsettled air in the room and makes it more of a pleasant experience with you meeting people for the first time and this would be more of the appointment uh, technique versus just talking to people out and about in the field so Ford is as you go day by day as you're meeting people as you're sitting on the soccer field talking to a soccer mom or a dad or sitting in there you can use it at a coffee shop you can use Ford anywhere anytime in that try to establish and deepen relationships with human interaction in that the safe island technique is where you're actually in a face-to-face -face business situation where you're going to use that to start off by letting people know what you're going to talk about, what you're going to ask them, what you're going to say, and getting them to feel comfortable in that business situation using a safe island technique. Okay. Any questions on that technique or everybody's comfortable? Yeah, before we start, this is what we're going to talk about. This is what I'm going to say. This is how long it's going to take and this and that and that just to give you an idea on that. So I just want to set the tone and let you know what's going to happen. And yeah, good for listing presentation, good for buyer presentation at the outset, right? So I may forward them and build rapport with them and ask them questions, but before I even do that, I will always open with the safe island and let people know what we're gonna happen and what's gonna happen and what we're gonna talk about and what's gonna say, okay? The next technique is called the Carnegie's Diamond of Salesmanship. So Dale Carnegie says to get people to trust me, like you, comfortable with you, and engage with you, you use these four skills every single time. Skill number one is using people's names a lot. So when I use your name and I use your name and I repeat your name in that, you feel like you're present, you feel like you've been heard, you feel like you care, you feel like you're uh, important in that when people like to hear their names, okay? So use people's names to build that trust and that likability and that comfort. Second strategy is smiling and paying people a compliment. So paying people a compliment, a sincere compliment, it's a lost art in sales. It's a lost art in the world. So when you do pay somebody a compliment, they feel special. They feel uh, liked. They feel uh, noted in that. Uh, smiling is is who wants to look at a pouty face. It takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. So smile. Uh, tell your face that you're happy in that. So uh, he always said to smile pay people a compliment, and use their names constant throughout the conversation. 
Next one is, and it's a it's a kiss of death for most salespeople, is that don't speak, don't tell. Talk is cheap. Show and sell. So use a visual. So visuals, uh, half of us are visual and half of us are auditory. So you don't know which one they're going to be. Um, visuals allow us to reinforce and to validate what we're saying and justify what we're saying and, and make it more concrete. So don't tell people, show and sell people. So use graphs, use pictures. The most powerful visual in sales is using a pad and pen to write things out and to draw things out and to do that. I love talking and writing and, and drawing and using a pad and pen as a visual in that. And it just solidifies, validates, communicates clearly in that there's a ton of upside to using a visual versus just telling and using a visual and sewing, showing and selling, okay? And then the last one is 86% of all communication is nonverbal, meaning it's tone, voice inflection, eye contact, and body language. And you're using 86% of communication tactics in that. So when you're using email and text, you're only running your chances of it being heard and understood at 14% versus when you're using face and tone and inflection and eye contact and body language, you're communicating at an 86% chance versus a 14% uh, chance of that. So that is a the techniques and the skill sets when you're dealing with people and dealing in sales to use names, smile, pay them a compliment, use visuals, don't tell, use visuals, show and sell. and be careful and note your tone, your voice inflection, your eye contact, and your body language, and be cognizant of that because that will increase your ability to communicate and to get the results you're looking for. And then the last technique that's also falls hand in hand with diamond and salesmanship is the mirror technique or mirroring, right? So you repeat what somebody says, you make the same body movements as what they say, but you don't want to mimic, you want to mirror. So the difference between mimicking and mirroring is saying exactly what they say or doing what they're actually doing. But in mirroring, you say what they say and, and say one thing extra. It's a plus one or move or act or, or physically do what they do plus one other action so that you're not mimicking, you're actually mirroring. And what it does is it makes people feel comfortable. It gets the people to uh, share with you, to get deeper into, into conversation. For those of you, I don't know if you have the same gift as me, is where your gift becomes your curse, where people feel so comfortable with you, they start sharing with you way too much information, things that you didn't want to hear or didn't want to know about in that. And that comes from your ability to make people feel trustworthy in that and mirroring them. And the classic gurus of this would be Barbara Walters, Larry King, uh, Oprah Winfrey. They are mirroring experts, and they're really good at getting people to get them to feel comfortable with them and share things that they shouldn't be sharing on national television in front of millions of viewers. So any questions on mirroring, any questions on the diamond of salesmanship, the safe island or the Ford technique, those are your four biggest and strongest and most powerful tools and techniques that allow you to get people to trust, like, connect, and feel comfortable with you in our industry and in our business. Any questions or any thoughts or anything like that on it? We're good. All right, let's get into the next fundamental. So the next one is the mayor campaign, the universal call script. Um, so these are script and dialogues that allow us to communicate structurally wise. So the mayor campaign, everybody's familiar with it. Four to five people would use their agent, but they don't again because they don't communicate and keep in touch with them. We're using the mayor campaign to identify those people that don't have an agent of choice. So I ask the question, hey, out of curiosity, what do you do for a living? And we lead into this dialogue and we forward and we converse, have this conversation. Mayor campaign is always used at the end of a conversation and as a afterthought. OK, it's not a mayor campaign is like, hi, I'm Wade. So just out of curiosity, if you had a friend or family member thinking about buying and selling, who do you sell? Who do you share? That's not what you open with, right? So we small talk, we forward, we safe island, we diamond the salesmanship, we connect and we build this rapport in that. And as I go or as I close, I use the mayor campaign and say, would you mind if I just asked you a question? 
out of curiosity, if you had a friend, family member, relative, buyer, coworker buying and selling real estate, who do you refer and recommend that business to? So you use that in the timing of the mayor campaign is usually at the end or as an afterthought as you leave or as you close, okay? The better job you do at explaining what you offer and what you exchange in exchange for them giving you their contact information, the better results you're going to have, okay? And again, I would emphasize that with the mayor campaign, don't tell me, right? Use the visuals again, use the Carnegie visuals, right? So show me your newsletter, show me examples of your Popeyes, show me pictures from your client party, uh, show me your stats and graphs and things like that. If you have those visuals showing them what you provide for your VIP or direct client program, you'll have a better chance of them wanting to give you their cell phone number, wanting to give you their their address, their name, their email address, things like that. So don't tell me, show and sell me and, and, and give me those visuals, okay? The next one is the universal phone script and it's LP Mama. It's an acronym that stands for you talk and dialogue about location, you talk and dialogue about price, you talk and dialogue about motivation, you talk about their assumptive clothes and you talk about their money and then you offer them to meet for an appointment, okay? So this is a universal phone script, call script, email script, uh, ad call, sign call script and that. You can use it following this and that. So we talk about if they're aware of the impact of location has on the areas and the sub areas and are they familiar with neighborhoods they want to buy and they want to stay away from in areas and how they differentiate between being on that side of the bridge, this side of the bridge, and are they familiar with those things and could we dialogue about that? Or I'll talk to them about the impact of price and values and that and where they can get better bang for their buck in that. Or I could ask them when they want to buy, why they want to buy. Uh, how they want to buy and who they're buying from through their motivation that and testing that. And then I love this and stop asking them the worst question in real estate is, are you working with another realtor? The worst question in real estate, because we have been programmed. Society has been totally aware of and programmed that they know that this question's asked and being asked and it's coming. And they know that if they tell you yes, then they're going to get you away and they're going to get you to go away. It's like garlic or a, or a cross or a spike for a vampire. All they got to say is yes, and they know that you're gone, okay? So my dialogue is this. I can only assume, because you're online, because you're on different publications, because you're looking on your own, I can only assume that you're not working with someone and you don't have an agent of choice and you don't have somebody working for you. I know from my standpoint, when I'm working with my, my clients and that I'm working with, they're not out doing the heavy lifting on their own. I'm working with them and providing that service. So I can only assume that you don't have an agent of choice. Would that be the case? Okay. So that's how I'm using that dialogue. Instead of asking them, are you working with another realtor? Don't use that. Use the assume dialogue, which I just shared with you there. Now I'm talking money in that. Are you using cash or using finance? And if they're responding in the finance standpoint, then who is that financing with and who is that person that helping with them? And have that dialogue about cash and financing and who that financing person is. And last but not least, you can bring up the challenges that they're facing, buyers and sellers in the marketplace, and that you have solutions to the challenges. And your response to and that closes this is let's get together. What's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing could happen? What do you got to lose? And you want to close for the sit down. You want to close for the face to face, the, the, the virtual, the Zoom call appointment. We're in the lean, mean appointment setting business and machine. If you're not getting face to face and you're not getting appointments, then you're not getting presentations and then you're not getting documents signed and you're not getting offers and you're not getting deals on that and you're not getting listings. So that's not a good thing. So this script is trying to help you with appointment conversion uh, and the mayor campaign is trying to help you with qualifying and adding people to your database. Any questions on the mayor campaign script or dialogue? Any questions on the universal so phone script on the LP Mama side of things, LP M A M A? We're good. All right. Next item up for bid is just the world's greatest conversationalist, according to uh, Carnegie, and the best salespeople are, are the ones that have the best arsenal of questions. They're the ones that know how to ask thought provoking, thought engaging, feeling changing questions in that. And so you having that arsenal in your coaching manual, there are some of the best buyer questions and seller questions in this manual go through them and find them i would recommend that they are motivational situational based questions to identify whether you got a live one on or you've got a tire kicker and a lucky lip 
Now, let me explain to you the types of different questions. There are open questions, closed questions, and yes, no questions. Open questions are simple questions that you cannot answer yes or no to. So they're rapport, dialogue, conversational questions. So you And agents always ask close questions. So are you working with another agent? Yes. Conversation awkwardly stops. So don't ask closed questions, right? They're direct questions because you'll get the conversation cut off and it'll be awkward and, 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 and weird. You ask open questions, which begin with the question, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And those are questions that are impossible for someone like, who else have you, what other properties have you seen? Yes, you can't answer yes to it. Or where else are you looking? No, you can't answer yes or no to these questions and that. So they are the best keeping the dialogue and keeping the conversation going are open-ended questions. Closed questions are direct questions and you're leading questions in that, but they're more important than a yes or a closed question is ask a yes, no question. And they are this, if I could show or share with you that you wanting to buy before you sell will cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Would you be interested in hearing more? So I'm leading them to a yes question or a no question, no answer. Yes answer or no answer, okay? So understanding the art of questioning, understanding how to ask the thought-provoking questions and the engaging questions, the feeling-changing ones, knowing how to direct and lead somebody with a yes, no answer question in that, um, is important skill set in being able to do that. And if you have to carry around a cheat sheet of questions to help you with it, or you, so you can remember which ones are the best ones, so be it. Do it. That's fine. Okay. So any questions on, no pun intended, on the open question, closed question, yes, no, directing question, or anything like that? Anything on that side that you could ask? We're good. All right. Next strategy is the appointment conversion. So how do I get a conversation with somebody to lead them to wanting to sit down and have an appointment with me, okay? So how do I get them to say, yes, let's get together? How do I close them? How do I do that? So I created a list of what I believe are the current uh, market issues facing buyers and sellers right now. So we had COVID, we have safety, we have down payment, we have deposit, we have finance, we have market collapsing issues, <coughs> excuse me, not knowing the process issues, timing issues, excuse me, <coughs> common mistakes for buying and selling, legal issues, contract issues, due diligence issues, um, can't find what they're looking for issues, area issues, multiple offer issues, selling first, um, everything's under contract before we can even make an offer issue, sellers don't know where they're going, <clears throat> have to sell before they buy because their equity is tied up, have to list, uh, and they're afraid to list that you'll end up selling it and leaving them homeless. A seller that's paid too much, need too much, want too much. Um, these are the common challenges in that. So what I do here is I say, just out of curiosity, have you been in a multiple offer situation? And are you familiar of some of the top 10 or 20 multiple offer strategies used in a multiple situation. And hopefully they're going to be like, yeah, we've been in one and no, we're not aware of those strategies. Well, I have those strategies. Let's get together. Um, you know, have you, have you had a trouble finding what you're looking for? There's ways of finding off market property or where are those ways? No. Well, let's get together. So what I find here is, is that you giving them and then them going away is a common problem with salespeople. So you give them the address, you give them the phone number, you answer their question, you solve their problem, and then they're gone. And then you and then they disappear. It's like you giving them the worm off your hook instead of having the worm and hook and then hooking them to do an appointment. You're just taking the worm off the hook and putting it in their mouths and letting them swim away. So stop doing that address the challenges and address them through questions and engaging thoughtful, thought provoking questions and help them become aware of those challenges. And then advise them that you have solutions and you just need to get together with them to share with them those solutions. Okay. So the solutions are the, the buyer's platinum program, the multiple offer program and multiple offer strategy sheet, um, the home sellers protection plan, those are solutions and processes for solutions to today's challenging places in the marketplace for buyers and sellers under these current times. And I just need 22 minutes of your time. 
because the statistics say that that's all I'm going to get. So right now it's at 124. So I just lost everybody at two minutes ago. So we've already passed our past our boiling point here for today already. But the reality is, is that I just need a little bit of time. What's the worst thing could happen to you? What's the best thing that could happen to you? And what do you have to lose? And why don't I just buy a coffee? You get free coffee, free donut, and you might learn something. And it's only 22 minutes of your time. What are your thoughts? Let's get together. Okay. So that is the awareness, addressing the challenges, offering the solutions, and let's get together LGT. And that is the appointment conversion sequence that you need to use to get people to want to sit down and chat with you. Okay. That's what we're in that chatting and appointment business. Any questions on that sequence? Any questions on that appointment conversion process? We're good. All right. Next one. So when I'm doing a sales presentation, you have to use certain strategic strategy in that. And again, another Dale Carnegie technique is that you don't tell me you use script and dialogue to show and sell me and for more importantly it's called the fact bridge benefit tie down so we know about our listing sales presentation our buyer sales presentation our pricing sales presentation i'm always speaking in fact bridging it three benefiting it and tying it down so for example um there are off-market properties let me explain to you why this is important to you there's the fact in the bridge Benefit number one, you'll find out about problems that were off market, uh, saving you time, saving you some money, and getting and beating everybody else and the buyers in that. Would this be something you'd be interested in? You want to expect that and want that kind of access to that kind of inventory, wouldn't you? And that's the tie down the bobblehead, right? So being able to speak in that fact, that bridge, that three benefit and tie down process makes it so that you're a sales person and a skilled individual and not somebody who's just talking and who's just chit-chatting, okay? And knowing how to use that process and maneuver and being able to steer the clients in the direction that you're wanting to be able to do that. Any questions on that fact, that bridge, that three benefit and tie down process in that in regards to the sales presentation and telling and, and selling difference in that? Anybody who have any questions on that? We're good. Man, oh man, I'm my lucky day. Everybody knows how to do all this so good. That's good. All right, next one. So objections. So I, with you today, what I did here was handling the holy hand grenades. And there are only 12 hand grenades in today's business, in our today's world, and that you're going to get at you. So I made a list of the holy hand grenades here. Hand grenade number one is, is that we want to wait. The next one is we're not sure. The next one is will you cut your commission? Next one is we don't want to uh, we don't want to open house or for sale sign or we don't want an open house. Um, we have a friend in the business. Next one is sell it ourselves. We need too much, paid too much, want too much. Uh, you're new to the business challenge. Why didn't your company or you show it when it was on listing? Uh, we want to shop around and get other opinions. We'll call you back. We want to buy before we list. And are you any good at it? And what's your credentials? And how many homes have you sold in the past? Those are the 12 holy hand grenades and the sacred 12 objections. The same ones that you will get from every buyer and every seller in your career moving forward. If you know how to respond to those and you know how to do them in that, then you're money, okay? So everybody go on off mute and can somebody give me one response to, we have a friend in the business, another friend and another friend of ours is a realtor. What would you respond and what would you say to that one? Do you want to mix, mix friendship with business? Yeah, perfect, Jeff. Yeah, so there's this, you've heard the term out there, haven't you? Give me your thoughts on this, Jeff. You've heard the term business is business and 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 pleasure is pleasure. What are your thoughts on that, that, that concept and on that idea, right? So I didn't say that they couldn't. I'm just questioning whether they what? Whether they should. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's worth the risk to the, the friendship to, to exactly, get involved. Right? Yeah, or my other favorite one, Jeff, is have you ever had, Jeff, have you ever, ever had to fire a friend? Yeah. <laughs> or, or Jeff, just out of curiosity, so you're friends, but if you're that good of friends, then what am I doing here today? Yeah. So it, I'm questioning whether it's a friendship or just acquaintance, because friends would bring their friend. They wouldn't bring someone else if it was a true friendship. Just give me your thoughts on that concept, right? 
And that's so there's lots of ways of responding without bashing the friend, making yourself look unprofessional in that. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Right. How do you respond that if you're new to the business? Lie? <laughs> no. No, do I don't I don't lie. No, what but do you say? What I do say is um well, one, I say that, you know, I work for a brokerage that's been around for a long time with uh, so much support behind me yeah. that I've got tons of training that I've, you know, had to go and get basically, a, I've done this course and um, that, you know, I've got lots of support. So, and also that, that I'm new, I've learned the current ways that I'm eager. I don't have as much on my plate, so I have more time to devote to them. Good. Um, but because I've gotten that one a lot, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what my response would be is absolutely I'm brand new, but let me just explain to you the benefits to you and then you can let me know your thoughts. So thought number one is, is that most veterans, right, are tired and they're unmotivated, right? And so that's the furthest thing from the truth with me. Next thing is, is that, that I'm a phone call away from almost 70 some years of experience between our three managing brokers, right? Our four mm -hmm. managing brokers. Um, so any question I don't know the answer to, I'm a phone call away for you and I to get the answers we're looking for. Next one is, is, is that if you're uncomfortable, I would be prepared to bring alongside another experienced veteran agent because I don't want to risk your money in that. And, and you could get two for the price of one. So let me know what top producing reputable agent that you have in our office. And I'd be prepared to, to co-list or co-buy with them and, and make sure that I protect your money like its own and you have that level of security in that. What are your thoughts on that concept moving forward? Because there's no getting around it. There's no getting away around it that you're new in that and, and that you're that you don't have a rap sheet and you don't have to do that. You have to come up with justifiable, definitive answers that that make them feel like there's a level of comfort that there's no risk to them doing business with some of you like you right and most not most top producers most teams in that like they won't even get to see that individual they'll get to see the assistant or they'll get to see one of the team members you never actually see the persons in the flesh because they're just too busy and they don't have enough time they have too many clients and too much going on but i do think this is where this is really important because i also think the answer you give and how you give it also conveys the confidence that you have in yourself yeah. And if you're not confident in yourself, why would they ever want to hire you? So you need to have thought about this stuff and have something ready that doesn't necessarily maybe sound canned, but right. that you really buy into and that you really believe. Yeah. And your response and how you respond, your confidence and your strength in your response, they can read through it. If you're just mumbling and you're just fumbling in that, that's why it's so important that if you know that these are the 12 that you're going to get, you practicing in advance what your response is and how direct it is in that. So option one is this, option two is this, option three is this, that. And worst case scenario, I will put your home and your money ahead of my own ego and I will bring in a veteran agent and you'll get two agents for the price of one. And I'd be prepared to do that if you really, if that's the only, if that's the only option I have, I would be willing to put that ahead of it and to do that and provide that option. What are your thoughts about that now? Right. So the, and so you can play that card or you can save that card for later. A lot of times I see new agents don't play that card and they lose the business, even though they think they got the business. They lose the business because you got to understand it's five, seven, eight, nine million five dollars on the line. And a lot of people aren't going to run the risk, even though you were confident in your response. They won't risk that kind of money sometimes on somebody that is brand new in that. And that makes sense to me was somebody that that magnitude of dollar investment in that. So understanding what these 12 are and understanding how to respond to them in that and not winging it and knowing that um, to take time and to sit down with those responses, make sure you you're aware of those and put time into responding to them. Okay. I don't know what you think of this, but I've also done this where, um, cause I have some really awesome clients and that are open to, um, having pe people contact them to see what it was like to work with me. And so I've done that yeah, before. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Past, yeah. past clients have kind of been a testimonial. They've gotten to call them and ask them yeah. what it was like to work with me. Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the techniques in here is called the feel, felt, found, Rebecca. And so what you should always do is use the feel, felt, found. So 
your feelings are are legitimate and they're and they're fair. Trust me, don't get me wrong. They're they're very well founded feelings in that, right? And most people have this year have felt the same way, uh, questioning that situation here. So I'm honoring their thought and I'm honoring their behavior. I'm not trying to build up a defensive mechanism, but let me just show you. Don't tell you again. Let me just show you. So I have pictures and testimonials with the names of the people, and I have a testimonial brag sheet for all intents and purposes showing people what they have found doing business with me moving forward in this past six eight twelve months if that makes sense so don't tell me show me pictures of the people with their testimonials i'm putting a brag book or brag sheet or two together and it's a visual not telling them but showing and selling them those testimonials if that makes sense yeah and i do i have that in my seller's awesome. package and in my buyer's package yeah perfect and so Many people have, right, your feelings are warranted, don't get me wrong, and pay, people have felt the exact same way in the last six months working with me, but let me just show you something that might help you understand um, what they found doing business with me, boom, and you pull it out, okay? It's called the feel, felt, found technique, another Carnegie sales technique as well. Works good. Like A few gray hairs helps avoid that one too. Yeah, you got that right. I got plenty of those too. Thanks, Jeff, for the <laughs> Okay, understanding the difference, you guys, between an objection, a stall, and a condition. So uh, definition of objection, it's the truth, it's the root, it's the deep down <laughs> pain point, or it's the deep down pleasure point. It's the thing that they hide. They're hiding from you, and you can only get to it if you don't dig unless you dig, okay? Now, the, the stall is just the words and the lies that they use against you or to hide the truth. Like, we'll call you back. We got a friend in the business. We got to think it over in that. That's a stall. Okay. The truth is what they're running from and what they're running to and what they're running from or running to. And that's the deeper down hidden meaning and hidden truth in that. Every buyer needs to be running to something or running from something, or there's no motivation and they're not a buyer or a seller. Okay. The last one is there's five classic conditions. These are things that you have to be aware of in advance. So the other decision maker or the silent assassin you need to be aware of. Uh, if they're not going to have enough money to buy or not enough money to get net to sell, you have to be aware of that in advance. Uh, they don't know where they want to go or the, what they want to buy. You have to be aware of. They won't, they're not prepared to manage and change their expectations and move their meter and that. And then the last one is they don't like you or trust you or they feel like they connected with you. Okay. So those are all the classic conditions that you need to be aware of every time and deal with in advance before you even get to the get to the decision making stage okay and that's so understanding the difference between an objection a stall and a condition right is important and then using the flow right so using the flow and the dialogue flow and that is is that you agree with them and you cushion it then you question it five or six or seven questions deep to get to the root and the truth. And then you isolate and say, so this is really what's, we we'll get it out in the open. This is really what we're deciding here. Let me just show you something you might find interesting. So I use visuals, statistics, stories, things like that to change how they feel, what changes how they think, which changes how they act. And then I go for the close. Do you have any questions? Does this make sense? How does this sound to you? What are your thoughts moving forward? Those are all closes, okay? All right. So understanding that objection handling flow, cushion, question five, six, seven deep, isolate it, visual handling it, stories, things like that, and then going for the close. And you close not once, you don't close twice, you always close three times because when you close three times, you'll increase your chances of getting a yes versus a no on your third time by 62%. Okay. So you got to close three times, don't close once or twice. Any questions, the objection, stall, condition, or the flow there, or the terrible 12 for objections in that? How do you deal with the, why didn't you or your company show it? That's a good question. Okay, so I'm going to pull out my, so let me just do the flow with you, Jeff. Hey, you know what, Jeff, that's an excellent question. It makes sense. I'd wonder the same thing, too, if I had my house listed, and nobody from my company and nobody else, and I didn't show it as well. Awesome question. So. What about that, Jeff, is concerning to you? How do you? What are your thoughts and what are your feelings about that? Tell me more about that thought. <laughs> Why? I had this one the other day, and yeah. uh, so, so asked, role, role play with me, right? What, like he's like, well, I mean, 
if you guys were so good, why didn't you bring somebody? If you guys are such a good company in that, why didn't anybody come around this, that, okay? So then I'll say, you know, so really at the end of the day, you're questioning us and our abilities because you didn't see us come by in that. Is that basically what you're saying? It's you're, you're trying to question, but you're, you have this unsettled feeling in your mind because you're wondering if we were any good or if we're any good at what we do. And we might be dealing you a bad set of goods because nobody came around from our company and I didn't come around from that company. And at the end of the day, that's leaving a, a question of doubt in your mind. Would that be fair to say, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Good. Thank you for that. Makes trades. So let me just show you something that you might find very helpful, Jeff. And explaining exactly why our company and why I didn't come. Okay. All right. So, Jeff, these are two sheets here. These are the top 10 qualifying questions that I use when I have realtor shows my listings and when a buyer inquires on my listings. So these 10 questions allow me to ensure that only the best of the best come through this property. And all and so I have all of these hard qualifying questions to ensure that I'm not wasting your time and bringing a looky loo and a tire kicker through. Have a look through these questions and th give me, let me think here. Let me sh show these. These are the sh these are the questions I ask the agent about their buyer. And these are the questions I ask a consumer about the, them inquiring about my listing of the property. What are your thoughts on there? Do you like these questions? Do you like the fact that I have these kind of questions in this system and this process in place to eliminate a tire cooker and a looky loo coming in your through your home and your listing? Would that is that something that would be important to you, Jeff? Looking at these lists of questions, would these be important to you, yes or no? Yeah. Absolutely, good. So you can understand that me qualifying harder and people in our company qualifying harder, we don't waste our seller's time and energy, just like we don't bring unqualified buyers through your listing when you had it listed with Joe Blow from ABC Realty, okay? So we take pride in our level of qualifying in that, and we don't need to waste your time because we have these virtual marketing tools that allow us to virtually take people through our home so that only the best of the best, the needle in the haystack is coming through your home when you're working with our company and working with someone like this. Does this answer your question? It makes sense why we and our company didn't come through your home, Jeff? Yes. So, Jeff? We need okay. like a little wage doll in our pocket that we can take with us everywhere. Just you know, it's got like a dial. So for this objection, hit one. <laughs> you just yeah. start. <laughs> <laughs> but did you see how I didn't tell you, Jeff? I showed and sell you and had those two lists of those questions. So all of you in this call, go make yourself ten freaking really good questions to ask a consumer that calls in in your listings, and one to ask a buying realtor that qualify them than their eight their buyer before they come through their and bring it there, and that solves your question there, Jeff, because I didn't tell you I showed and sell you on it right does that make sense yeah yeah wade your thoughts in dealing with couple where one person has a strong opinion perspective the other does not you need the both to have both on the same page otherwise problems of potential of the silent assassin so so maybe unmute greg and give me a little bit of a, a scenario here and that's so i can so i can blow you out of the water like i just did with jeff and his hand grenade. I'm, I'm, yeah, but I'm a tougher audience, so I don't know. If from Toronto. Well, I mean, either that or you're getting way too deep on me. But go ahead, I'm willing to play here. Let's go. Possibly. No, uh, no. I was just a question because it was actually from a friend of mine uh, that I was talking to, and he yeah. was dealing with, uh, and I it created a question for this because I've seen yeah. it. But uh, you've got a couple. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it, this is a made-up uh, example, but yeah, I, I've come across it, uh, and and there's usually not always, but usually someone that's kind of dominating that 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 conversation and the other person might jump in and it doesn't matter if it's male or female i mean someone's you know moving it along so my question is if you've got that one person that seems to be on the page let's say it's a couple yeah it could be a a, a listing presentation yeah you're yeah, talking yeah. to them and the yeah. one person i'm going to make it you know the generic guy going yeah yeah we're going to do this we're going to do that and yeah. some of it's on the same page as you or not, and you're kind of adapting your right. script and, and your conversation mirroring. Yeah. But the other person is giving you kind of nothing because it's kind of back to those personalities we talked yeah. about. Yeah, 27 so you, years of my sales career, who's the decision maker, the guy that's flapping their gums or the silent assassin that's sitting there quiet? No, the silent assassin. It's Correct. The silent assassin. The, the lesson so what I is, try to do. So the lesson in here is, is that who do we focus our energy then on? Well, most certainly the silent assassin. Exactly. So we we acknowledge the person that's speaking, and then I turn to the assassin and say, 
What are your thoughts? Agreed. The problem what is with uh, that type of person. Pardon the, me? The type, that type of, the issue I, that I, I think might sometimes present itself, and I'm interested, interested in other explorations of it, is that that type of personality sometimes will give you those closed-ended questions, even if you give them an open-ended question. But they will, if asked, and knowing that they're the decision maker and knowing that you are legitimately honoring their thoughts and feelings, they will speak up. But they need to be probed and they need to be given the platform and the respect where the respect right. is due in order to them. So I'm empowering them to share their insight and wisdom with me sincerely. And they love that because they their right. biggest thing is security and being heard. Because they have this Muppet of a spouse with them that they would just love somebody else to listen to them other than the Muppet. No disrespect, right? So Tina yeah, just no, would true. love somebody to listen to her and care about her and give her the attention to do. So that zipper head, and it's funny, if you came and sold me, guess who's the silent assassin in our house when you go come to Tina and I? Guess who's doing all the talking, who's shutting up when you come to my house? I'm the silent assassin. I say nothing. I sit back there and I'm like this watching you, Greg. And Tina's like, blah, 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 because I'm totally opposite at home in an appointment setting than I am in business and out sales in the front, if that makes sense, at work. Totally makes sense. I, yeah, yeah, I agree so with I'm you. I'm actually the silent assassin in this particular case, which, which you have to be so careful, right? Because you'd assume I am, but I'm Myrtle the turtle and the silent ninja assassin at home but the opposite at work. Well, it makes total sense because you need, I know that you plug in for energizer batteries when you go home, right? Well, it's, and, I, and I don't, <laughs> real, and, I, and I, let, I let my wife shine because I don't need to, because I've shined all day. You know, I've been the front guy all day, so I don't need to anymore in that. But she really right. enjoys it when somebody asks her and lets her shine, right? You know what I mean? She comes well, a lot. It's a good point. It's a good point you bring up too, because it's the the two faces that we all have as well, yes. right? Because yeah. right, everyone does have that double face. You're obviously yeah. going to be a professional face, but you're also going to have that. Yeah, and that's an interesting point because a when you go into out, their homes, yeah, you're a tiger out in the workplace and you're a turtle at home. You're usually the opposite, perfect. right? And she's a turtle yeah. at home and she's a tiger outside, right? Kind of thing. Like she has to go. Mm -hmm. that, every one of us on the call is a 180 out there, right? Like, and, and that, and so we have a bit of, uh, forgive me, but we're all two split personalities in that, and that, and yes. it's based on that. But I, back to your point in that is that you have to be really cognizant of that and really aware of who really is the decision maker. And, and, and please don't take this sexist that, but you're right. There's always the same person that cuts the check and there's always the same person that, that makes the decisions of buying the homes. Right. And I'm not being sexist in that, but a majority of the time there's a certain sex that cuts the checks and makes the decisions in this and in, in 27 years of and that right and and so i just saying is that you got to figure out who the one is that's writing the check and you got to figure out who the one is really gets the final say and who's the final decision maker right and when it comes to buying a home i could care less i do care but i don't care less. as long as tina the 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 just final decision maker is 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 happy and is it good in that and i'm not trying to be sexist and don't try and care don't get the, me the wrong way i'm just saying it, your ability to be aware of it and be cognizant and, and know how we're a turtle out there uh, and, and and a tiger and how we change roles and that in those particular situations and that it's a good and thing it's a good thing i wanted I was, yeah I, I, that's a good point and the other thing um i think too is um to your point uh, like in, in the tina example i mean never underestimate because yeah, there's the, the he, you know, he or she that's writing the checks, but the other person is like you're saying, quietly listening and analyzing it, and you know that they're going to have that that conversation after you're long and gone, right? So yeah. I think the other part too is with that probing is sometimes that two step process we talked about where you yeah. you engage with them and then you yeah. respect that space and allow them yes. to have that and say why don't we set the second meeting? Yeah. And that person, that individual, both, whether male or female, really appreciates that. They have their conversation and you address it head on on the second meeting, right? Right. And my needs and her needs and are different, right? She needs to feel like she's gets, she's buying a home. I need to feel like I'm getting a deal. Does that make sense? Right. That's that it. Does. That's it. We have two different needs. So if you can address that she needs to get that feeling that she's buying a home and I need to know that you feel like I'm getting a deal, 
then we're, our needs are being met, both of ours. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And being cognizant of it, like truly understanding what their needs are, what one person's needs and wants are and the other person's needs, because they're going to be remotely different, totally different. Mine's I want a deal and I'm happy, right? I want to play the game and I want to grind. That's what makes me happy. I don't want to worry about all this other crap. But hers is I want to be the experience and I want to see stuff and I want to have a vision. I want to feel and that, right? And I want this to, I want to see myself and my grandchildren and everything else and that, right? And that, and they're, they're totally different needs. That. And you being cognizant and respectful and aware of that with each party you're dealing with is an incredibly important thing for sure. All right, good. We'll move on. We're good. All right. Thanks. Good dialogues. Good dialogues. All right. Um, five, six, seven technique. We talked about that. So going seven questions deep and getting to the root and getting to the source. The slap method was a uh, was a technique that uh, you're in the storytelling business, folks. So being a storyteller is key. So using the storytelling method slap story lesson application participation so if you're able to talk in that way where you share a story you share the lessons you learn from that story uh you share how you applied it or someone else can apply it to their own lives and 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 charge them to take action and do something that's called the slap method i shared with rebecca the feel felt found you know rebecca your feelings are completely warranted they're legitimately true and so many other people have felt the exact same way dealing with me as well as a new newer agent but let me just show you something that might help you understand and see what they found doing business with me please and may i show you that that's great the next one is the three r dialogue so i um you know you repeat what they had to say you reassure them of what they had said you they had been heard and you ask if you can resume so for example we have a friend in the business hey that's great greg um you know uh, I've heard you and you've got a friend in the business. That's awesome. Uh, just rest assured that today I'm never wanting to put people in a position where they would make a decision they're going to regret. And, and you will never be put in that position doing business with somebody like that. Knowing that, is it okay if I just keep going and I'll get back to that and I'll deal with that later? So that's a repeat, reassure and resume technique that you use um, with people when they're throwing grenades at you in midstream and mid sentence and mid mid business and mid conversation. Okay. The next one is the what is it, is it technique. So this is when I ask you to make a decision like as a seller and a buyer. And I say, if we can agree on price, do you see any reason why you wouldn't want to list with me? And I get in crickets. So then I don't give up. I probe and I go back and I say, so Jeff, help me understand here. I'd asked you a question a few minutes ago that if we could agree on price, you'd sign. You didn't see any reason why we wouldn't want to do business today. So you're not in a position to do business today. So I must have missed this something. So give me a second here and let me just go back and ask you a couple questions. So Jeff, was there something about me and how I do business and how you felt about me and that? Was there an issue with me? And you're like, no, no, there wasn't anything with you, Wade. We like you. We trust you. We think everything's good in that. Okay, so then was there somebody, something about my company or all a page Kelowna, the organization that, did you have anything that you might've had run-ins with somebody from else and another agent in my company in the past? Is there something about my brokerage or something about one of my peers in our organization that might not allow you to make a decision today and do business with me? No, it's not your brokerage. No, it's not somebody else, Wade, that's okay. Was it my marketing plan? Did you see something from someone else that you were hoping to get done with marketing of your home and I'm missing it because I'd love to know what it is, learn about it and implement it and get a chance to put it in. Is it my marketing plan? No, it's not my marketing plan. Okay, great. Uh, then is it my fee for service? Is it what I'm charging? And uh, do you feel that there's a, a, a disconnect with what I'm offering and what I'm charging in that? Is that the issue? Uh, no, no, no. And then 99.9% .9 of the time, it's always about price. So Jeff, what it really is, is that is your, are you feeling like the price that I suggested I wouldn't be willing to try it at a different price? Do you feel like it's it's locked in gold? Do you feel like I'm not willing to market it and try it at that? Are we really talking about something in regards to my price and that what I suggested and what you're thinking? Is it price then? Is that what we're really talking about? 99% of the time, guys, it is price, but I start with me and I build up to up to the decision and the thoughts that it's price. They may be feeling that, your word is, the, is their word, that you're not willing to take it and work it and try it at their price, blah, blah, blah. There's always something that boils down to their price and your price. It's always the game changer in that. Now you have a choice to either try it or to walk away and not take the listing. And again, I would take it and try it if they have to sell or need to sell. Okay. I would walk why away. Why don't you start with the price first? What's that? Because why don't you start with the price first? 
Well, because I'm trying to probe just in case it was me and there was a dis- I'm trying to I'm trying to explore and go through all the other channels before I get to price Jeff. It's kind of a method of exploration than just going to the root of the problem. I know it's price, but I'm going to build up to it and I'm going to do a little bit of research and reconnaissance and lead into it, building up to just check in case it is me, in case it's my company, in case it's someone else, in case it's my marketing plan or my fee for service. I'm going to lead up to it and build up to it because that's what you do in sales. Most people don't want you to be so direct. Maybe you would, Jeff, but not everybody's like that. I'm like that, but not everybody's like that building up to it. Or being so direct and nailing it, hitting and and going right to the source. I'm okay with it, but but not a lot of people are, if that makes sense. Sixty hmm. percent of the people that work in our organization are not A type direct personalities in our business, just so you know in our office, Jeff. Sixty percent of them are not. Right? So they're high analyticals and and they're high detailed explanations and that and going through the process and that. That's that's 60% of our organization that works for us and our population of realtors. Okay, so imagine your client's population, right? There's not a lot of whack jobs like me that are off the charts, high D, high I, and, and A type whack jobs out there. Thank goodness, hey guys. All right, next one closing, asking three times versus once or twice, or forgetting to ask. Ever. So ran into an agent last night that his daughter lives next door to me. He's like, hey, man, I did that, that negotiating course with you and I used something you said. I said, at what price would you buy this house? And they wrote an offer. And so, uh, so you know, you got to ask, like, can you see yourself living here? At what price would you buy this home? Do you like this home enough to buy it? Right. You've got to probe and you've got to ask and you got to close not once, but twice, but three times. OK. And then the last one is I'll close with this today was. What's your response to the most powerful question in sales? Why you? Why your marketing plan? Why your brokerage and why now? Right? And how and your answer has to boil around to about how you save them time, money and s- surprises and mistakes. That's what your response has to be around, okay? How you save them time, money and mistakes is your answer to number 17. And you need to debunk the myth that all agents are the same, all marketing plans are the same, all brokerages are the same. And you need to debunk the myth that there's no sense of urgency, right? Which is the furthest thing from the truth and that, and you need to know how to explain that, okay? Yeah, Rebecca, go ahead and ask a couple questions. Sorry, wait, it's actually... It's about a contract. Can I like oh, fit? Just call me. Is. Just call me. When we hang up, just call myself. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Anybody else? Anything else I can address or anything else in that? I'll send you guys this. The, I'll email you this this, uh, this list of things in that. Um, I'll send you the recording and go through it so you can listen to it again in that. Hopefully you got a nugget or two and this was helpful to help sharpen your sales skills and that hopefully jeff you can use that one and and put together those questions for for consumers and questions for agents and their consumers to help you explain to them why you didn't show it why the company didn't show it <laughs> now yeah, it was too expensive wasn't the right answer so uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's okay it's truth but it doesn't help you get the listing though does it <laughs> wait uh, one one thing you shared in one of your training once was a one line that we've used a lot is we just ask people if you were gonna put an offer on this home, yeah, what do you think you would offer? And then with the listing presentations, when we're getting towards, we've shown them the comparables. We use that question that you said. Well, what are you thinking you would you would list your home at? You know what's happening around that way. You kind of they give you a price or they say, I don't know, or maybe they give you something way too high or way too low, but you're prepared yes. for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's you're, you're, le- you're ultimately empowering them to make the decision, right, Annie? And that, and you're putting that, because exactly. it needs to be their idea, their decision, their, their money, their, their house, everything, right? It can't be you and that nobody likes to be told, just ask your kids. Yeah. Right. Yes. Awesome. Okay, you guys. Have a good week. We'll chat in a couple of weeks. And I'll send you this stuff. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Be well. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.